Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning to everyone at home. It's a wonderful day for some. It's Father's Day. It's always a wonderful day. But Father's Day is something special for fathers. And our reading today, if you want to turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, It's a very lengthy reading. It's verses 12 to 14. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you were strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. When you first look at that, <clears throat> you start to think to yourself, why is John repeating himself? And I think part of it is the fact that we have it in English but I'm told by the Greek scholars that there are shades of difference, particularly in the words that are used for little children. And first, he embraces the whole family of God. I write to you, little children, the whole family of God, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So John there is speaking to all who belong to the Lord and that's then proven by the rest of the verse because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And that's true of all Christians. It's a wonderful thing to know as a present possession, the complete remission of our sins. Notice too that our sins are forgiven for his name's sake. It is for Christ's sake and for his suffering on the cross and his bearing away our sin in his body on the cross that God forgives us when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done. Then he goes, I write. Fathers are described as those who have known the one who is from the beginning. Now here he's talking about mature believers. When he says fathers, he doesn't necessarily mean just simply the male of the species. It includes women as well. There are some very, very mature Christians who are female. And people get hung up on the terminology of the scripture when it says fathers. It includes any of God's people who are mature in the faith what he means by fathers <clears throat> in that sense we can say the the absolute ecstasy of knowing that our sins are forgiven is for most of us a long way behind us and we have settled from that ecstasy into a deepening love for the lord it's not the excitement of when you first became a Christian. It's the deep, deep knowledge that nothing whatever can ever separate you from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor this earth, nor anything in the heavens, nor powers or whatever. Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But you grow into that position. 
How do you grow? Well, all Christians, mature and immature, have come to know God, but their knowledge ripens with the years. Children know him as the father. The fathers have come to know him as the immutable, eternal God who doesn't age as humans do, but is ever unchanging from the beginning. You know, we talk about past, present and future, but God is all that. Unfortunately, sometimes people tend to think of God as being like us and he's in the creation. No, he's outside of creation. He created the creation. He's outside of it. He's in it as well, but he's outside of it. He's not limited like us to things like past, present and future. To him, the end and the beginning are all there together. Don't ask me to explain it. I can't. But that's what the Bible says. He knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end and everything in between. And when you stop and think about it with each one of us, with our individual lives, he's ordered the lot. And even if we set a foot aside somewhere along the line and we wander a little from the true path, he brings us back. And he's always welcoming because nothing can separate us from the love of God. No one can snatch us out of Jesus' hand and no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. <clears throat> well, then in between children and fathers, we find those that are referred to as young men in the spiritual family. They're characterized by vigor and combat, superior of conflict and wrestling with the foe. He says, young men, you've overcome the wicked one. They've learned the secret of victory, namely, not I, but Christ living in me. That's the Christian life, not just enjoyed for forgiveness of sins and the fellowship of God, but in battles with the enemy. The forgiveness of past sins must be followed by the deliverance from sin's present power and justification and sanctification. Little children, they're babes in the faith. They don't know very much, perhaps, but they know the Father. They know Jesus. Through Jesus, they know the Father. And then John repeats his address to the fathers. It appears to be the same as at the first. Again, because they've achieved maturity and spiritual experience. And again, he addresses the young men and tells them they're strong. They've overcome the wicked one because the word of God abides in them. The Lord Jesus was able to defeat Satan in the wilderness by quoting scripture. At both times, John asserts the young men are victorious and strong because the word of God abides in them, allowing them to overcome or master the evil one. And that emphasizes the importance of constantly feeding on the scriptures and having it ready to repel the attacks of Satan. Fathers hold positions of honor and authority. Children are in positions of learning and lack status and authority in that sense. Young men were generally associated with strength and vigor. F.B. Meyer tells us, here they had overcome the evil one by participating in Christ's victory. Although some ancient writers often considered young men more vulnerable in particular temptations, especially sexual immorality, John expresses his confidence in them. You see, from God's perspective, there's only two families. There's the family of God and the family of Satan. Or if you like, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. If you're not in one, you're in the other. There's no standing on the fence because there is no fence. John reminds his readers in these verses that Christians have been forgiven. And they've come to know God as their heavenly father. And as a result of salvation, they are part of his family. 
and they must not love Satan's family or give allegiance to the world that's controlled by him. The word little children in verse 12 is general for offspring of any age in contrast to a different Greek word for little children in verse 13. And then we have, I write and I have written. Now there's a difference there, but why is it there? Well, John MacArthur says, that John repeats the message in these verses to emphasize the certainty of their belonging to God's family. I write is from John's perspective, while I have written anticipates his reader's perspective, uh, perspective when they reach, read, receive the letter. That's one way of looking at it. John was writing to believers of all ages. The children had experienced forgiveness through Jesus. Those who were mature in the faith had a long-standing relationship with Christ. The young in the faith had battled with Satan's temptation and had won. Each stage of life in the Christian pilgrimage builds upon the other. As children learn about Christ, they grow in their ability to win battles with temptation. As young adults, they move from victory to victory. They grow in their relationship with Christ. Older adults, having known Christ for years, have developed the wisdom to teach young people and start the cycle all over again. There is another way of looking at John's terminology, and this is MacDonald's view, Another way of looking at it is the epistle is written as a companion to the gospel. Therefore, I write refers to the epistle, which is in the act of composing. And I wrote or I have written refers to the gospel, which lies completed before him in that sense. And on which the epistle serves as a commentary. If you break it down according to that explanation, I write, and the reasons for writing it, to all of you, you have been forgiven. To the old among you, you have knowledge of the word. To the young among you, you have conquered the evil one. And then I wrote, or I have written, referring to my gospel and the reasons for writing it, to all of you, you have knowledge of the Father. To the old among you, you have knowledge of the Word. To the young among you, you have strength, have God's revelation in your hearts, and you have conquered the evil one. In any case, whichever explanation you prefer, the inference is clear. Fathers are those who are mature in the things of God. Young men, are those who are growing in strength in the word and children are assured of their salvation, but they have a lot to learn. The role of the father in the church is to encourage and mentor the young men to fatherhood, to teach the children and raise them to be young men. And that's in a spiritual sense, as opposed to the natural. In the natural, Fatherhood is the act of being a father as opposed to merely fathering a child. There's a big difference. You can father a child, and that doesn't mean that you're a father in the sense of fatherhood. And of course, fathers come in all shapes and sizes different colors, different backgrounds, different ideas, different worldviews. They have different aspirations for their children and different ways of connecting with their children. They are likely to view their role as fathers based on how they were fathered. That's the first one. Their perception of what a father ought to be 
And then there's always their spouse's perception of fathering responsibilities. The portrayal of fathers in the media or in the entertainment industry. And the public perception of their role. Now, I'm sure all of us here are sufficiently chronologically mature to remember that in the 60s and 70s, there were a number of shows on TV that were all about families and fathers, and one that springs to mind, Father Knows Best. Father always had the answer. Compare that to the role of fathers as it's portrayed in the 2000s. Fathers are little more than doddering idiots who are always stuffing up and it's the mothers who sort things out. A complete change of roles. Now that role portrayed in the media rubs off on the ones that watch that show. So what sort of sense do they grow up with in relation to fathers. Respect for fathers, respect for authority, and all that breaks down. And that comes from the media, the entertainment industry. Of course, I mentioned there about the spouse having a certain perception of fatherly responsibilities. Well, the women will gain that from how they were fathered. And you know, one of the things I read once that stuck with me years and years and years ago, the best thing a father can do for their children is to love their mother. And if a father loves his mother as Christ loves the church or loves their mother as Christ loves the church, they'll grow up in a social setting which provides security, it provides constancy, and it provides sound moral and spiritual standards. But today, oh, where did I read somewhere again? I read all sorts of things. I think it said something like about... Uh, Is eighty five percent of single parent families are fatherless. Now that that's that's horrible. Eighty five percent of single parent families are fatherless, and the other fifteen percent are probably fathers bringing up their children without a mother. God's idea of family is male and female complementing each other. And speaking practically, the different dimensions of fatherhood include breadwinning, nurturing, modelling, socialisation of children, involvement in their children's lives, moral and spiritual development and providing a sense of stability. And good fathering is hard work. But it's the most important kind of work that a man can do, whether it be in the natural or spiritual sense. And one of the things that <clears throat> I often thought about when I was in the uh, police, particularly in the criminal investigation branch, you work shifts, you got a particular job when you're on, a, say, a, a night shift. You're working 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And at five o'clock in the morning, you get involved in the investigation into a picketing, a rape. You don't get home until three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, yeah, the overtime is great. But what about your kids? You get home, you're so tired, you don't even eat, you crash, you sleep because you've got to be back at work again at 10 o'clock. And I could remember days where I would go for several days 
and I only saw my children when they were asleep. And that puts a desire within you to spend quality time with your kids. And with my son, he played soccer and he, was, uh, and he played cricket. He was pretty good at both. And I managed to organise a little bit later on when I was back in uniform again and I, and I was in charge of the, the particular station, I organised my work. That Saturday morning was my morning with my son and nothing would separate me from that morning with my son, whether it's soccer or cricket. It wasn't that I was out there playing with him, but I was with him. I was there. And that was my quality time with him. I spent other time with him. I, again, another book when I was <clears throat> reading something where sociologists say that most fathers actually spend less than a quarter of an hour a day with their children, quality time. They might be there, they might be sitting watching TV together, but quality time where you're sitting and you're talking to, talking to your son or daughter about schoolwork, about something else. And when they're little, there's nothing more important than reading to them. They think it's great when dad comes in and reads them a story and prays with them before they go to sleep. They don't forget things like that. <clears throat> Why are fathers so important for the well-being of children? The answer lies in the larger issue of why families are important. You see, strong families are the basis of a strong society. They provide stability and ensure the continuity of civilization by uh, propagation of the species. <clears throat> That's a horrible term, isn't it? <laughs> and socialization of children. But it's true. God created families, and in Malachi 2.10, we read there, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? And then further down in verse 15 in part, but he did not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit, and why one? He seeks godly offspring. God is looking for godly offspring from godly parents who have a stable marriage and a safe environment for the children. When that breaks down, society breaks down. And what are we seeing now? One of the men at Sheds made mention of the fact, I think it was last week or might have been, yeah that uh, his daughter is a school teacher and she has 36, I think. I think he said 36 children in the class. Three of them have mum and dad. And his daughter told him once that uh, she heard a conversation between some of the children. I was saying, uh, Where's my dad spending tonight? Is he going to your place or your place? You know, and they were with single mum families. Where's my dad spending tonight? I don't know. Is he going to your place or your place? What, what sort of stability is there for the children? What sort of standards have been set? The answer is none. They don't have it. And when society doesn't have that, the civilization is in decline. And civilizations are destroyed from within, not from without. When their moral standards of any civilization breaks down or any, well, I'll call it civilization. Though in, uh, <clears throat> in our terms, we mightn't think of some of them as being civilized, but when when the stability of the family breaks down and the moral standards break down, the civilization goes into decline and will implode. It'll destroy itself. 
It's happened to every one of them. It's easy to think of the Romans, probably one of the greatest civilizations that existed. The Egyptians are the same, the Egyptians and the Romans, they imploded because their internal standards and morals and family life broke down. <clears throat> In Ephesians 4, 6, we read there, we have one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And Paul was there writing to Christians, not to the world generally. Today, as I said, is Father's Day. That should also cause us to reflect on a growing problem of fatherlessness. The absence of an active, positive father influence in the lives of children. Whether caused by divorce and broken families, by tragic death or by deliberate single parenting, more and more children grow up without fathers. And sociologists and psychologists alike have identified a number of social and personal problems caused by the absence of a father. Children with little or no contact with their fathers are more likely to drop out of school. They're more likely to become involved in drug and alcohol abuse. The girls are more likely to become pregnant in their early to mid teens. And boys are more likely to become involved in crime and violence when they're raised in a fatherless environment. Now that's only one variable contributing to these kinds of social problems, I know. But it's one that can't be ignored because fathers play a key role in the socialization of children. But ultimately, or unfortunately rather, even when a father is physically present in the home, he may be emotionally absent. Work commitments, yes. Providing for the family, that can limit the time a father can spend with his children. But he should seek quality time, a positive presence in their children's lives, demonstrate unwavering love, provide support financially, emotionally, mentally, physically, socially, and spiritually. That provides consistency and where necessary, practice appropriate discipline. Although many single parents embody these qualities and valiantly raise their children to healthy adulthood, blessed is the child who has two parents working together to provide all these things. When I was in the police, I once heard an address by Brigadier Jim Wallace, a former commander of the SAS, and the title of his speech was Dare to Lead. And of course, the SAS is Dare to Win. But it dare to lead. His message was essentially that of leadership and leadership being about the exercise of the spirit. He talked about leadership in battle. He talked about leadership in the corporate world. But I couldn't help thinking how this applied to being a father and giving leadership in the home through example. Those characteristics come from the word of God. In summary, the Bible sets out God's principles for fatherhood. Development of spiritual and moral beliefs in children, parents as teachers of values, fathers as models of masculinity, fathers as moral guides, moral leadership and shared responsibility in the family. Now, there are several, several different words that are used in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek, but they all spring from the same root, where father means nourisher, protector, and upholder. All of that comes from the fact that the Lord God is the creator of family and therefore fatherhood. In Ephesians 3, verses 14, and 15. For this reason, 
I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, we tend to think of family as mum, dad, and the kids. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the concept of family has a deeper root in that God has a divine family expressed often in the use of family injury, uh, imagery. Not handling my words too well this morning, am I? God is our father. God is a husband to his people. Isaiah 66, 13, for example, says God is like a nurturing mother. And Christ is the bridegroom of the church, his bride. In a human family, grounded in godly principles, the nature and life of the divine family will be reflected. You know, Jesus never spoke about the fatherhood of God. <clears throat> he just addressed God as Abba, as father. Abba is an Aramaic word that implies something deeper and more direct than our abstraction of fatherhood. It's a very close and a very intimate relationship. Our relationship with God is as close and as direct as that between any parent and child. We are created individually in the image of God. Jesus is God, but he became a human being as a baby and grew as any other human being does. No doubt learning much about life from Joseph, a man chosen by God to nourish, nurture, protect and uphold him to manhood. But God is also the God of the fatherless. His word expresses great concern for orphans. As his family, we too should have great concern for orphans and for those who have no father to ensure they acquire a saving knowledge of the loving father and his son, Jesus, from whom all families on earth come. Well, that's probably enough. I could talk on this for hours. You know, Joseph is Jesus' father. The attack on the fatherhood of God, they want to call him Mother God now and change everything to him and her. That is, those that don't want to say him and her, they want to say their and those and them. And commandments. Honor parents. What happened to that? Ephesians 6 4. This is a whole different topic. Fathers, don't frustrate your children. Jesus, not using the term your father to Pharisees and Sadducees, but always of himself, my father, and to the disciples, our father, your father. Let's have a look at Ephesians 3, verse, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> verses 14 to 21. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, oh, I love those two words, not just abundantly, but exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, 
for ever and ever. And we all said, Amen. Now, I'd just like to conclude with a, a short prayer and incorporating some of the words of a Father's Day message that was sent to me by my daughter and a couple of grandchildren. Father, as we come before you this day, we ask, Lord, for your blessing upon the reading of your word. And we think of you on Father's Day because you are our Father. And I offer a prayer for all fathers that God will keep you always in the shelter of his care. May he guide you in your daily work, bless everything you do and grant you all those special joys that mean the most to you. Amen. And I think that the special joys for most fathers is their children and their grandchildren and to some, their great-grandchildren. Bless you all. Thanks, Josh.